Hello, I'm Angie with Card Eddie Magazine, and I'm here with Jonathan, Jonathan Siegel, who just did a beautiful session for us here at the vault. Um, so now we're going to go over a few questions. Thanks. Um, I, looking at your resume, you have such an incredible history and so many, like, so many amazing things that you've been doing with music your whole life. Was there a moment you know, at a young age where you realized that this would be your lifeline? Oh, boy. I think it's always, it, I've always just thought that I would be doing music. I mean, I remember um, I started taking music lessons when I was really, really young. And despite, what was your main instrument? Well, uh, I didn't start playing guitar until I was seven. But before that, I had like taken piano lessons in recorder, you know, and and had bad experiences with piano teachers, like pounding fingers into <laughs> yeah. pianos and stuff like that. But I think when I started playing guitar at seven, I I really uh, realized that I liked that. And then I started playing violin when I was ten because. Um, this girl, Susanna Stein, I was really into her, and she played <laughs> Pop Goes the Weasel at our, some break at school, and, and she plucked the string for the pop. And I was like, what a cool instrument. So, And now she is a, a symphony player in New York. Oh, fancy. <laughs> yeah, I know. So She's it's something good. you just always knew that you would be doing yeah, this. Yeah, I remember drawing also draw, like, drawing little pictures of like, sort of like Cousin It, you know, just only hair with uh, electric guitar and top hat and bat wings or whatever like when i was little yeah you should put those on ebay yeah <laughs> seriously yeah right <laughs> we'll be all over that so yeah i just it was just i just played music the whole time mm -hmm. when i went to college at santa cruz um i was studying music uh composition actually i was actually at that point doing mostly chamber music and you know mm -hmm. orchestra music and stuff like that and it wasn't I, I didn't get back into the rock music um in college after sort of abandoning it after high school for a little while until I started playing with Camper Van Beethoven. Yeah, well, Camper is, you know, one of your, probably your most well-known band. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, you helped pioneer the underground radio, rock radio scene of the 90s with that band. Can you speak to some of the early days of formation? And well, we formed in Santa Cruz in, well, actually, okay, the band had initially, David Lowry and Victor and Chris Mola, Victor Kumanaka and Chris Mola, had actually been in the band in Southern California on summer breaks for between college and... Uh, between semesters of college in 81, 82, I guess. And uh, I didn't actually start playing with them until 1983 in Santa Cruz when they were back at college there. Mm -hmm. um, but by the time we started playing in San Francisco in like 84, I guess, um, it was pretty much the punk rock scene. We were playing at, um, I think it was the Viz Club before it was the Kennel Club, before it was the Independent. No, before it was Justice League, before it was the Independent. And uh, the graffiti, which is now Amnesia, and places like this, mm -hmm. and Nightbreak on Haight Street. So we were playing a lot of like sort of rock and punk rock venues. And, uh, you know, we're coming up from Santa Cruz, and people are like, what the hell? What's this underground stuff? What is this <laughs> stuff? Yeah. So... That was uh, and that was fun, you know. And we didn't make our first record until 1985. Okay, came out in June of '85 on Savage Republic's label, uh, independent project. And then we hooked up with Rough Trade, who was over here on Sixth Street at the time, and um, and started our own label, Pitch a Tent Records, and started putting out not only our records through Rough Trade, but also many other bands like Donner Party, uh, which mm -hmm. had Sam Coombs, who's now in Quasi, mm -hmm. and. Um, Spot 1019 and some other wrestling worms. My first solo record, Monks of Doom, bands like that. Cool. So yeah. Um, you've been involved with you know a number of bands as well as been involved in many like solo endeavors. Yeah. How can you kind of speak to your creative energy and the difference between kind of relating to a band at the time and also being on your own? Yeah, it's definitely a it's definitely a different thing. I mean, in Camper, um, I mostly play violin. Uh, I do some keyboards and some guitar, but we have. David Lowry, who's able to strum and sing like a demon, so I don't need to do that in that band. Mm -hmm. And Greg Leiser, who plays lead guitar like nobody else. And so I basically get to fulfill a sort of color role, I think, more in that band. And that's fun. But it also, um, it, having done that for now 27 years or something like that, I, I sort of know what it is that I need to do to be a band leader. And it's quite different than being that role. Mm -hmm. um, you know, strumming and singing if you're the focal point of a song, is definitely a different role. Um, uh, 
When I played in Sparkle Horse, it was similar. Like Mark uh, Linkus sang and strummed the guitar, and I had a little ring of things around me. I had a keyboard and a glockenspiel, an electric guitar and a violin, and so I would basically be everything that wasn't the guitar and wasn't the rhythm section was what I did mm -hmm. in that band. <laughs> And I think when I first started fronting my own band back in like 1989, it was a little odd because I wasn't used to uh, having everybody uh, uh, rely on the front man to make sure that it was... Uh, to drive it. Yeah, to drive it, but also to make sure that like you were confident enough to say, yeah, you guys should be uh, you know, backing me up here sort of thing. So that's an, it's an interesting situation to be in. Right. You, know, you have to build yourself up a little bit of confidence to be able to do that, definitely. How do you feel? Um, you got your master's in music composition from yes. Mills. Yeah. How do you feel like after you, you got that in academia, how do you feel like you're, that have changed your approach to creating music? Um, I've definitely gone back and forth in, in different styles of music. I, l I listen to a lot of different kinds of music. Um, when I went back to get my master's degree, I was in a weird uh, musical he headspace, I think, because um, I had been playing on my own for a while, my own rock bands, and I produced a record by Clyde Wren um, and played with his band for a little while. And then had played with Sparkle Horse, which was, you know, funded by EMI Capital. And when I was out of Sparkle Horse in 1999, my only real musical endeavors were, um, I made this record, that record, uh, Scissors and Paper, the red one mm -hmm. that, that's sitting over there. And after playing in Sparkle Horse, where the peer group, the people that we'd been hanging around with were like, Polly Harvey and Radiohead and people like that, I felt uh, pretty bad about my own stuff. Like, uh, gosh, this is really not as good as what those guys are doing. So it took me a long time to finish that record. Right. And, I, and I, at the time, was uh, scoring some films. Um, I did a film called The Invisibles, which was at Sundance in 1999, and I'm sure straight cool. to, you know, uh, blockbuster video or whatever. Nationwide theater yeah, release. Yeah, never got nationwide theater <laughs> release. And some other ones and stuff like that. And I had sort of, I was sort of uh, unsure, I think, about what I wanted to do creatively on my own. Mm -hmm. So when I went back to school to study composition, it was one of those situations where it was like, you have the entire history of music behind you. You can do anything. The The horizon is incredibly, incredibly vast. There is There are no limits. So it was, it was very difficult to figure out. It's daunting, out. yeah. It's daunting, yeah, to figure out what to do. And so I got, uh, I got sort of back into uh, the avant-garde heavily and improvisation heavily. Mm -hmm. And I had been sort of schooled in, in uh, the avant-garde improvisation world by playing with Eugene Chadborn for a long time in the 80s and early 90s. And again, again, at the uh, end of the 90s. So um, at Mills at the time, Fred Frith was uh, and is still one of the composition teachers there. So I was his assistant for the contemporary performance ensemble for the, the years that I was there. It's a and, good education. Yeah, it was, and that was a great education. And Joelle Leandro was uh, teaching there, and she's an amazing improviser. Alvin Curran was there, Pauline Oliveros. All of these people who are amazing, not only composers, but improvisers. So I, I really heavily got into that. Also, Chris Brown uh, was teaching electronic music there, and I got very much back into doing electronic music. So I spent a lot of the early part of this last decade doing a lot of sort of improv and electronic music mm -hmm. as well. 